Hello, are there any questions? If not, please bear with me. My computer is gonna be a little slow until the uh, lecture is, uh, uh, the lecture file is converted. Trying to get to uh, my file here. If there's no question, let's begin. You should be able to see my screen. There we go. So today is October 6th, and we should be covering uh, lab four on stains. Uh, you can take a look at the uh, last Tuesday's lab. I talked about all the assignments I graded on Tuesday. I don't think I did any grading since then. So, uh, let's see. I think I'm going to shut this down. It'll save a little bit of computer space. We are. Uh, The uh, lesson is being made. And is it lab four we're doing today? Is that right? Yes, stains. I think this is the worksheet I'm opening. No, this is the long lab module. This is the one I want. All right. Lab four, staining techniques. There is some pages to read in the textbook before you do the lab, but it's not, although there's a fair length of it, each one is short. You're gonna read about the different size, shape, and arrangement of bacteria cells. You'll read about the bacteria cell wall. You'll read about the simple stain, read about the differential stain, read about the gram stain, you should read about the acid fast stain because we are going to cover that in today's lab. And then you should read about the special stains. We're going to talk about the capsule stain, staining for endospores, and staining for flagella. There are some uh, video clips to watch in today's lab and a virtual lab, I believe. I might be wrong on that if that's so. Uh, uh, well, well, we'll look into that when we get to the uh, get to the lab. The learning objectives for today's lab: be able to prepare a bacterial smear for staining. I do realize that you're not going to be doing this in reality, but you should know how to make a bacterial smear, at least theoretically be able to understand the principles and the procedures used when performing a simple stain, a differential stain, and then the special staining techniques. Be able to interpret the results for a simple stain, a differential stain, and a special stain. And then lastly, be able to define the terms that are applied with this lab. So what's a simple stain? What's a differential stain? What's a special stain? What's a coccus? What's a bacillus? What's the spirillum? What's peptidoglycan? We haven't really talked much about it yet. And then gram positive cells, gram negative cells. What's acid fast, like an acid fast stain? What's the primary stain? What's a mordant? What's the decolorizer? What's a counter stain? What's a capsule? What's an endospore? And what's a flagella? 
because of their extremely small size, bacteria are practically transparent. Therefore, it's often necessary to stain them before viewing them under the microscope. Preparing a bacterial smear is almost always done first by putting a drop of sterile water placed on the slide, bacteria then added, and then the smear of bacteria in the water is then smeared all over the slide. Ideally, you only want the cells one cell thick in the bacterial smear. You then allow the slide to air dry, and then you heat it to fix the cells onto the slide. Both the air drying and the heat fixing attach the cells to the glass slide so that they don't wash off. It has the added advantage that air drying and heat fixing also tends to kill many bacteria cells. It does not kill all bacteria cells, but it kills many. A simple stain is a stain that uses one dye to stain the cells. This is actually a little bit of correct, incorrect in the, uh, in the lab module. It says a simple stain is a basic dye. A simple stain can be an acidic dye. It's just using one dye. And then all the cells will stain the same. A differential stain typically uses two or more dyes and provides additional information where you can see differences in the cells. The gram stain is the differential stain we will talk about the most. And lastly, there are special stains, and their purpose is to stain special structures within the bacteria, like the flagella. It's a structure that does not show up uh, when you're applying other stains, and you have to use the flagella stain to specifically get the flagella to show up. And the flagella stain is one special stain that shows up the flagella. Any questions about any of that? There are many special stains and they will show uh, different structures within the bacteria. When we're talking about bacteria, you should know that they come in different shapes. There are circular cell, cells that we call cocci, and they look like three-dimensional little balls. And then there are cells that are rods, and we call those bacilli. And in truth, with bacilli, we do call them rods as well. They may have rounded edges, as this was shown here. They could be pointed edges, like here, or they could be blunt edges. There are also spirilla, and please do not call them bacilla, spirilla bacilli, this uh, picture is, but most people just call them spirilla. And they are spiral, like an S-type shape. And a spirilla is not a bacilli, because here's a bacilli. It doesn't bend in an S-type shape. OK? Those are the three basic shapes for most prokaryotic cells, cocci bacilli, and spirilla. There are other shapes, but even those other shapes tend to be, they tend to be a form of one of these three shapes. All right, any question about any of that? If not, we're also looking at the cell growth arrangement or the cellular arrangement, and that is how the cells grow together. 
you can have individual cocci where there will be a single cell, sort of like these. There can be uh, streptococci where the cocci line up in a row. There can be tetrads where the cocci line up in groups of four. There can be uh, sarcinia, which I'm surprised that's not shown here, but maybe I'm talking about that later. Nope, not later. Uh, sarcinia, where the cells line up in groups of eight. So it's two uh, tetrads hooked together. There's diplococci, and that's where the cocci are two cells stuck together. And then there's staphylococci, where all the cells, well, not all the cells, but the cells are stuck in a large group. Let me finish that there. My computer will now work better because the uh, uh, lecture file is finished converting. Uh, staphylococci literally means cocci, round cells that grow in a cluster like grapes. So staphylococci means like grapes. With bacilli, we have a few arrangements, cellular growth arrangements, but fewer than the cocci. You can have singlets or single bacilli. You can have diplo bacilli, which isn't shown here. You can have strepto bacilli, which are bacilli in a chain. And when we call them strepto bacilli, the chain of bacilli, uh, let's go ahead and do it this way. The chain is on the stuck on the long end. So hopefully you can see that. That's streptobacilli. If the cells are stuck on the short edge, we don't call them streptobacilli. I'm going to draw that now. Can you see that? Can somebody tell me, confirm you can see that? Yes. Uh, this we call a palisade. Palisade. And if those of you, is there anyone who's read Huckleberry Finn or Mark Twain? Tom Sawyer, I don't remember what the names of the books are called. Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, I think. Nobody's read those books? Wow. Uh, in uh, those books, they talk about a palisade fence. And if you've ever seen wood stuck together like that to make a fence, that's what we call a palisade fence. And that's what we call bacilli when they're stuck together that way. Any questions about any of that? The point is there are not the other shapes. The bacilli do not form tetrads. They do not form staphylotetrad. Okay. Uh, did I mention they do form diplotetrad? That would be two two tetrads, uh, two bacilli stuck together. They do form that. The spirilla, it's very easy for them because all of the spirilla stay as singlets. They do not have any other cellular growth arrangement. All right, any question about the bacterial shape and the bacterial cellular growth arrangement or the cell arrangement. 
the arrangement, remember, is the, how the cells are stuck together. And then the shape is the shape that the cell is in. All right, let's talk a little bit about the stains. We mentioned that a simple stain is when you're staining with what, just one dye, all the cells take on the same color. The differential stain allows the cells to stain differently. And then you can see differences between cells. The most important differential stain is the Gram stain invented by Hans Christian Graham. You don't need to know when he did, but you should know that Dr. Graham invented the stain. And that's why we call it the Graham stain with the capital G. If you write it with a little G, that is incorrect, incorrect English. In the Graham stain, the crystal violet is the primary dye. And what happens is the bacteria take in the crystal violet and then they're stained purple. If they continue to hold the crystal violet and the iodine, uh, then we call them Gram positive cells. And at the end of the Gram stain, they will stain purple. While bacteria that do not retain the crystal violet, we call them Gram negative cells and they appear pinkish. Let me see if I can blow this up. Now here we see a gram stain. There's a gram positive cocci, a gram positive bacilli. Now here we have a gram negative spirilla, a gram negative bacillus. I don't see any gram negative cocci. at least in this picture. The Gram reaction is based upon the cell's ability to retain the crystal violet. And the crystal violet is retained within the bacterial cell wall. Gram positive microorganisms, or I should say Gram positive bacteria, contain a thick peptidoglycan layer. While Gram negative bacteria have a thinner peptidoglycan layer. So here we see a gram positive bacteria cell. That's the plasma membrane. And then they have a cell wall shown here. And it's almost all made up of peptidoglycan. And it's a very thick layer, layer upon layer of peptidoglycan. The gram-negative cells, on the other hand, is shown here, and there's the plasma membrane. It does have the peptidoglycan layer in the cell wall, assuming the cells have a cell wall of bacteria. However, the layer of peptidoglycan is thinner than in the gram-positive bacteria. There are many layers of peptidoglycan in the Gram cell, but it's many, many times less than the gram positive number of layers. And I'm not sure how many layers in the gram negative cell, but it's more than just a few. It's something like on the order of a hundred layers of peptidoglycan in the gram negative cell. And then in the gram-negative cell wall, we have on top of the peptidoglycan another layer. And it's actually lipids, mainly lipids. I should say mainly lipids. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. All right, any questions about the gram stain? Some bacteria either do not stain well with, with uh, uh, the gram stain, or they don't 
I guess that's the correct way to say it. They don't stain at all, or most likely they don't stain well. And what happens is they, they have a bacterial cell wall, which has a lot of lipids in it. And the lipid is macaulic acid. And macaulic acid does not allow molecules dissolved in water to come into the cell wall. And the uh, crystal violet, especially the safranin, is dissolved in water. And so these cells do not stain the mycobacterium well. Sometimes when we look at them, they'll look gram variable. Other times they won't stain very well, so they'll be real light in color. Most of the time, the mycobacterium do stain purplish, but they're kind of lightish, a light purple, meaning they don't stain real dark. When they stain gram variable, they're staining gram variable for a reason. And when we look at this slide here, what do you notice about this cell here? And maybe that cell, kind of that cell, compared to this cell or that cell, or especially that cell, what do you notice? What's different between that cell and this cell here and this cell here? There's variability within the cell of the stain. Yeah, the gram positive cells have a very distinct cell wall and they have a very distinct shape and they stain very darkly. These cells do not have a very distinct cell wall. Let me blow that up a little more. Especially that one looks ghostly, looks like a ghost instead of a cell. And this one, if you look at it right here, it looks like the cell is broken right here. In reality, this is a dead cell and the cell wall is decaying. And the same with that and that. And that's why these are staining the way they are, kind of like a ghost where the cell isn't entirely there. The boundaries of the cell are not distinct. It's because they're dead. And when you use the gram stain, I've never told you that, but I'll tell you now. You know, that should have been in the lecture where I was talking about problems in the gram stain. Maybe we just haven't gotten to it yet. And one problem with the gram stain is it needs to be performed on freshly grown cells. Cells that are old will have lots of dead cells. And the dead cells may stain differently than the viable cells, the living cells. So the purple cells are viable cells. The dead cells are staining, in this case, pink. And so it's not really that the mycobacterium are gram variable. It's that the, micro, the gram stain was stained inappropriately. Somebody was using old cells to stain the mycobacterium. And so that's why it's staining gram variable. The viable cells are staining gram positive. The non-viable cells are staining gram negative. And with the gram stain, like I said, we should always use freshly grown cells. If the cells are older than two days old, you should not do the gram stain. And whenever I've looked at students who got a gram variable result, they were always staining mycobacterium. And I asked them, how old are these cells? And they were always old cells. Usually they're older than two weeks old. And I stated, well, that's the problem. You should only use the fresh cells when doing the gram stain.
whenever I've done the gram stain on mycobacterium, they always stain gram positive. Now, admittedly, I haven't stained that many species of mycobacterium. But for all the ones I've done, they've always stained gram positive. All right, some temps, some tips to doing the gram stain. Avoid using old cells when you're doing the gram stain. Prepare only a thin smear, because if you have your cells layer upon layer thick, it may be difficult for the dye to get through the layers of bacteria and get the cells on the bottom. Conversely, if you're trying to decolorize the cells, it may be difficult for the decolorizing agent to get through the layer of cells and then pull out the crystal violet iodine from the low down cells, meaning the cells which have cells on top of them. So ideally, you should have a thin smear. Ideally, one cell thick. You should heat fix the bacteria onto the slide after it's only air dry. If you deep fix the cells before they've air dry, you call, cause the water to bubble in the cells that will damage the cell wall and then the cells will not stain correctly. You should also over, avoid overheat fixing the cells because you heat the cells too much you will disrupt the cell wall and then they may not stain correctly. Actually, when I've noticed that cell students overheat fix the cells, it tended to make the cells look like they melted. And then particularly their shape would not be correct because the cell would melt. You should use only fresh staining reagents when doing the gram stain. Do not over decolorize and do not under decolorize. And then look at the cells under the slide where the cells are ideally only a, a, a single layer thick and they're evenly dispersed. And that will help you with the gram stain. Any question about any of that? All right, if not, another differential stain is the acid fast stain. The acid fast stain stains the mycobacterium and nocordia, two families of bacteria that have mycolic acid in their cell walls. These bacteria are able to re resist acid. Uh, alcohol decolorization, and therefore we call them acid fast bacteria because they stain positive with an acid fast stain. Other cells which do not have mycobacteria in them will be acid fast negative, and they will not retain the acid fast stain. So when we look at cells and stain them with an acid fast stain, see if I can blow this up. The uh, acid fast stain is pinkish, and this would be an acid fast bacteria, positive bacteria, acid fast positive bacteria, such as a uh, mycobacterium. And then the other cells, which are staining bluish or green, depending on what the counter stain is, are acid fast negative cells, and they lost the acid fast stain. We lose it in the decolorizing step. Any question about any of that? All right, there are also special stains, and they stain a special a characteristic of the cell. One special 
characteristic is the glycocalyx. If the glycocalyx is firmly attached to the cell and you can see it under the light microscope, we call it a capsule. The negative stain or the capsule stain can stain the capsule. Here we're looking at the cell. There's the cell proper, the cytoplasm. There's the cell membrane, right there's the cell wall. And it has a sticky substance around it that we call the capsule. The capsule uh, can be associated with an organism virulence meaning that the capsule can make the cell more pathogenic. For one reason, the capsule tends to protect the bacteria from the host. The host has phagocytes and the, the capsule prevents the phagocytes from engulfing the bacteria. Capsules also tend to make the bacteria, when they're growing as colonies, take on a mucoid appearance. So these bacteria made a cell capsule, and these colonies are mucoid looking. Uh, this is uh, the capsule stain, where we're staining bacteria Klebsiella pneumoniae. And the capsule stain does stain the cell and the background, but it does not stain the capsule, which is around the cell. If you were to use the gram stain, you would not see the capsule. Uh, the primary reason is uh, the uh, gram stain uh, is too harsh and the capsule will tend to wash away with the gram stain. Uh, I don't think the gram stain, even if the capsule were to stay on the cells, I don't think it would stain because in the gram stain, the background typically isn't staining. And so the background and the capsule would both not stain, assuming the capsule would stay, which most of the time with the gram stain, the capsule would wash off the cell. But with the capsule stain, we can see both the cell and the background are stained, and the capsule is not giving us an easy view of the capsule. I think I've got another picture of a capsule stain, which is India ink. Maybe not. Nope, I thought I did, it must be in the lecture. All right, any question on the capsule stain? If not, let's move on to the endospore stain. It is another uh, special stain that specifically stains the endospore. An endospore is a metabolically inactive, hardy structure that is produced by some bacteria as a survival strategy when the environment becomes unfavorable. What happens is the environment becomes unfavorable so that the parent cell knows it's going to die. And so the parent cell, before it dies, it makes an endospore. And then the endospore can survive the harsh environmental conditions. Then when the environment becomes favorable again, the endospore will germinate giving rise to a metabolically active vegetative parent cell. A vegetative cell is just one that is metabolically active. It's engaging in metabolism. 
it is growing and reproducing. And Indospore is doing none of that. It's, it has very little, if any, metabolic activity. It is not reproducing. It's not moving. It's not a vegetative cell. Uh, the endospore, all its purpose is to do is to survive if the environment is harsh. Any questions about endospores? We'll talk about endospores at least three times during this class. So it's one of those important topics we will come on and talk about time and time again. Uh, most of the bacteria that form endospore come from two families of bacteria, the bacillus family and the clostridium family. This table is showing you some of the bacteria of clinical significance that produce endospores. You'll need this table, to, excuse me, to answer some of the lab questions today. Any questions about the endospore stain? Or about endospores? All right, the endospore stain uses a stain which gets inside of the endospore. And then in the decolorizing step, the color, the stain does not come out of the endospore, but it does come out of the vegetative cells. And then you use a counter stain, and that makes the endospore stain greenish. I'll tell you the stain in the endospore is malachite green. And then the other stain, the counter stain, it's usually safranin. And the vegetative cell, when you're using safranin, causes them to stain red. The point is the endospore stains differently than the vegetative cell. And here we're looking at an endospore, which has come out of the parent cell, so it's all by itself. These are parent cells, the red ones or pinkish ones. And here we have an endospore that is inside the parent cell. Any question about any of that? All right. The Schaefer Fulton stain is one stain we use to stain endospores. There's also a flagella stain. The flagella is a long thread like appendage that's attached to the cell, and its purpose is to allow the cell to swim or move. So if the cell can swim in liquid media, it has a flagella, assuming it's, excuse me, if the cell is a prokaryotic cell and it swims in liquid media, it has a flagella. And here we're looking at a picture of cells stained with the flagella stain. To answer one of the questions in the lab, you need to know the different types of flagella, meaning the flagella arrangement. But I'm not going to quiz you on these arrangements. When you look at the flagella stain, you'll note that not all the cells have the same flagella arrangement, meaning flagellar arrangement. Uh, this one here is peritrochus. This one here, it looks like all of them are arranged on one end. 
So that would be Lophotrochus. If you look real hard, like maybe this one right here, might be Monotrochus. And I'm sure you could find some Amphitrochus in this picture. When you see a mixture, you take the highest flagellar arrangement. So we would say these cells are staining peritrochus, even though there's a mixture. The reason why there's a mixture is this cell put out its first flagella. That's why it's amphitrochus, there's only one. And then this cell looks like it's got two on one side. Let's see if that's, uh, that's lophotrochus. And what happened is it put out more flagella. And so now we're staining wherever that one was here, something like that there, I don't remember. And if you look hard enough, you could probably find amphitrochus. And then these three are clearly peritrochus. What happened is they put out all of their flagella now. Uh, this one looks like it may still put out a few more, but it's already peritrochus. And so this cell, if given enough time, will become peritrochus. But at the moment, it's only got one flagella. Okay, so that's why we use the highest flagellar arrangement you see to describe the cells. Any question about any of that? All right, know the terms of this lab. No need to do the references. And then let's talk about the lab exercises. You're not physically going to be performing any of this, these activities because you're working on, on the computer. But you must understand how to prepare bacterial smears for staining. You must know the principles and procedures used in the various staining techniques. And you must be able to interpret the results from those different stains. So in procedure one, we're preparing a bacteria smear for staining. And here we have a little video for preparing a bacteria smear. And here on this link, we have how you actually uh, air dry and heat fix the bacteria smear. And then read through how you go about doing a bacteria smear. And then move on to procedure two. In procedure two, we're doing a simple stain, and we have a little video clip on performing a simple stain. Read through the steps of doing a simple stain, and then answer the questions. You'll note a simple stain causes the bacteria to stain about the same color between all cells, bacilli and bacteria. So answer the questions, describe the cellular morphology, the shape of E. coli shown here and Staphylococcus aureus. And I will point out that if you see a bend there and then a bend here and a bend there, maybe a bend here, that's because there's one, I mean, two or more cells stuck together. So the correct shape would be here or here. So be careful of the, that question there. And then answer the question, what's the total magnification? And we tell you what ocular lens we're using. Uh, excuse me, objective lens we're using. 
So answer that from the total magnification. All right, then do procedure three on the gram stain. We have a little video for you to watch on performing the gram stain. So watch that video. And then we have a little virtual lab on the gram stain. If you go to the virtual lab, that actually came while well, it's still loading. It takes a little while to load. And then get to it. Uh... Hi, lab assistant. Welcome to the yogurt section of the dairy processing plant. It appears that our latest batch of yogurt might have been contaminated by some undesirable bacteria. Uh, just to pick the, click the continue link. All yogurt has bacteria. We go through. Unfortunately, this is what plain good yogurt looks like. Notice the uniform texture and color. Now take a look at this yogurt. See how the whey and water are separating? Are those air bubbles forming near the bottom of the bottle? These, this yogurt looks, let's collect yogurt samples and prepare them for viewing under the microscope by doing a gram stain. In the gram staining process, we will use different Bacteria that stain a pink or reddish color like this are called gram-negative, and their presence means the yogurt is contaminated. Bacteria that are used... We are going... All right, let's prepare our slides for gram staining. To prevent bacteria from contaminating our work area, we have wiped down the table with a 70%... You're going to use a striker to light the Bunsen burner. Okay, so the gas is turned on low already, so bring the striker to the Bunsen burner with the flint side facing down and squeeze the striker to create sparks. It's still too loud for me. Um, so this is an interactive lab in a different place. You come like that, you get the Bunsen burner going. We need to dilute the yogurt before we put it on the microscope slide. We'll use a PB. Start by placing one milliliter of the diluent into a test tube using a pipette. This is an inoculation loop, a small loop of wire used to collect samples. Start by sterilizing the inoculation loop in the flame of the Bunsen burner. Hold it directly in the After it has cooled down, use the loop to obtain a small sample of yogurt from the suspect container. To get a good sample, reach Place the yogurt sample into the previously measured diluent, PBS. Now, gently shake the test tube for 5 to 10 seconds to thoroughly Use the inoculation loop to sterilize the inoculating loop again in the flame of the Bunsen burner. Hold it directly in the flame until it glows. Transfer a small amount of sample from the test tube to your prepared slide. The previous one, why you heat the loop after you grab the bacteria is to sterilize the loop because if you were to put the loop down it would bring bacteria with it wherever you touch the loop uh, it looks like this has died for some reason place two loops full from the sample onto the slide i'm not sure where the slide is Oh, I see. We're giving you pictures to what to do. All right, any questions about Tilt this? the slide to spread the drop out slightly, about the size of a penny. Now we'll heat fix the slide. This prevents the bacteria from being washed away when we begin the staining process. They didn't mention it, but you do need to let the slide air dry before you heat fix. 
Place the slide in a clasp, such as a clothespin, and pass it over the flame of the Bunsen burner. Now we begin the staining process. After the staining is complete, we use four chemicals to stain a slide. We apply them in a specific order and rinse the slide off under slow running water in between each chemical. Uh, any questions about this virtual lab? If not, I'm gonna stop here. All right, let's go back to the lab. So we have a virtual lab for you to go through the steps of making a bacterial smear and then go uh, on to doing the gram stain. Where am I? Once again, we have the different steps of the gram stain in a picture. Uh, when you add the crystal violet, all the cells are blue purple. When you add the iodine, all the cells, they're more of a purple purple, a little darker too. And then you do the decolorizing agent where the cells now become gram positive, remain purple, the gram negative become clear. And then you add the safranin where the gram negatives pick up the pinkish color. And then answer the questions, the gram reaction, is the cell gram positive or gram negative? E. coli and Staphylococcus aureus. Here, this picture is broken, but there's the E. coli and there's the Staphylococcus aureus. And then answer the question, what's the cell shape? Coccus or bacillus. And then answer the question, after Staphylococcus aureus, what color is Staphylococcus aureus after the primary stain is added? E. coli after the primary stain is added, Staphylococcus aureus after the alcohol acetone step, E. coli after the alcohol acetone step, and then Staphylococcus aureus and E. coli after the counter stain is stained. So tell me the color of the bacteria after each of these steps. Procedure four, you're going to be performing the acid fast bacteria stain. We have a little video clip I'm performing the acid fast bacteria stain. And this is going through the steps of the modified Kenyan acid fast bacteria stain. With it, you first apply carbol fusion, which is the primary stain, and it will stain all of the cells reddish. You then apply the acid alcohol wash and it's the decolorizing agent, and it will pull out the carbol fusion from the acid fast negative cells. You get that? The acid fast positive cells will retain the carbol fusion. And then you add the counter stain, which in this case is brilliant green, and then the Acid fast negative cells will stain green. The uh, acid fast positive cells will stain red. Read through the procedure of the um, acid fast stain. And then we have a picture here showing you different cells with two different acid fast staining methods. You don't need to know about the staining method. I think this is the one that the uh, video was talking about. And then this is another acid fast stain. Uh, both of them stain, uh, the acid fast stains red. And you need to state what this cell is, acid fast positive or acid fast negative, and this cell. And this cell here, you've got to state what it is, and that cell here. If you can, you can write it right by the arrow. If you can't write it right by the arrow, then in the lab, write it like right down here. Just type it in. Uh, leftmost arrow is whatever. And then step down. The second leftmost arrow is, state what it is in the acid fast stain, either acid fast positive, or acid fast negative, 
and then state, I guess the third leftmost arrow. And then the last arrow is this one. Okay. So if you can't write it here, just write it down here. Any question about any of that? Then do procedure five on the special stains. We have a little video clip to look at the endospore stain and another video clip to look at the negative stain. We then give you three pictures and tell you the magnification, the total magnification is a thousand times. And we have three bacterial smears, A, B, and C. It states in A that this is the Schaefer Fulton stain. You have to tell me which dye it uses as the primary stain. And it ultimately dyes what? So what is the color, the primary stain shown here? And it states that these things which are colored by the primary stain are produced by some bacteria to aid in their survival. And then for, uh, that would be one, two, so part A3 lists some examples of pathogenic endospore producing bacteria. This you can get from the table in the lab module. I don't think we have the table in the exercises, but it's in the lab module. So let me go to that table. Endospore stain. There we go. So here are the table you need to look at for answering those questions or that last question. And it says some examples. So if you only give one example, it is wrong. It's partially correct, but it's also partially wrong. It says some examples. All right, in B, picture B, this is a stain of what? And it says it coats long whip-like appendages, which aid in motility. And here we're seeing it there. So what stain is that? And then state the flagella arrangement type and see in the picture. And remember you use the highest flagella, flagella arrangement and then list some examples of clinically significant bacteria that produce flagella. Once again, you must give some examples. If you only give one, it's going to be partially wrong, at least partially wrong. And you can find the list of bacteria that are clinically significant that produce flagella in the lab module. I'm not sure if this is in a table or if it's just discussed in text. I don't remember. Yeah, it's, it's just in text. So in this region here, it tells you some bacteria that produce flagella. In C, for picture C, this is looking at a stain that uses India ink or nigrosin that can be used to detect what structure of a cell. And it states that structure is located exterior to the cell wall and prevents phagocytosis. So this is picture C here. Let me blow that up. That still needs to be blown up. No, yeah, that's better. Is 
and then list some pathogenic microorganisms that produce capsules. And once again, look in the lab module, it gives you these. When you're done with those questions, you then have two case studies to answer. Case study one is given here, and it gives you the information about the patient here. And the doctor performed an x-ray on the person's lungs. I have a normal lung. Let me see if on your copy, I got a picture of normal lungs. Oh, I don't have that on the, on the lab. Nope, I don't have it. So I don't know if I have a picture of a normal lung, but uh, there's something wrong with this lung here. The lung should look totally dark. And there's definitely something wrong in that area there. And this is a patient's sputum smear. And this is the staining of the patient's sputum smear with a specific dye. And it's stating they're doing the acid fast bacteria smear. And this is the results. So interpret the results. And then based on that, uh, give us the most probable diagnosis. You must name the species which is causing the infection of the patient. In case 24, a case, excuse me, case study two, we have a 64 year old diabetic patient and he's admitted to the hospital with soft tissue necrosis in his foot. This looks really bad. Now, uh, there's a routine culture on a gram stain that's done. And here we see the gram stain. It does give you a hint. The bacteria only grew anaerobically. And then we have the Schaefer Fulton stain. So look up what that stain stains. And then we see results here and here. And then name the species of bacteria which is causing the infection. And you can find the species in a table in the lab module. Okay, you must name the species in order to get the correct answer. All right, any questions on the lab? If not, go ahead and get started on the lab. I will be here at least until eight o'clock or until the last student uh, signs off in the lab up until the class ends, which I think it ends at 9.20. Any questions? All right, if not, go ahead and get started on the lab. I will be here at least until eight o'clock and I will be here until the last student logs off or until 9.20. Thank you. All right. Oh, I didn't do that one.